Over seven million different animals inhabit our planet. The Sala story to me is a very incredible one as well. What can they teach us? Poaching, but not in the traditional sense for like meat or medicinal use. It's the use of snares. And I- Many species are in crisis and need your help. Join the movement at allcreaturespod.com. Welcome to the All Creatures Podcast. This is Chris. And I'm Angie. Angie, it's pronounced Sao La. I've been practicing, Chris. Sao La. Sao La. Yeah, that's okay. I can roll it together. Sao La. Yeah, there you go. I know for as excited as, a, as I am for today's podcast, I've been wanting to do this species pretty much since the inception of this podcast, mm-hmm. uh, because today we're going to be talking about one of the world's rarest large mammals. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Hoof and, and horns. And I wrote hoof, hoof and horns. And ho- right. And hoof yeah. and horns. So, yes, yes. Uh, I mean, basically the mysterious Asian unicorn, and it doesn't get mm-hmm. any more cool than that if you ask me. And but for goodness sakes, I couldn't pronounce the darn name to save my life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because, and, and the reason we know that is because this Thursday. Yes, yes. Uh, earlier this week, I was able to have an incredible, probably for me, I mean, eye opening. Mm-hmm. I don't, I mean, just heart strings, pulling on my heartstrings, yeah. conservation, mind changing interview with Dr. Barney Long. Who is uh-huh. uh, this? Uh, who is the director of species conservation for the Global Wildlife mm-hmm. Conservation Organization? And he mm-hmm. is basically like a mm-hmm. Saula expert. I've uh, been working yeah. over in Vietnam and Laos and for fighting for their mm-hmm. conservation for close to twenty years, if not a little bit longer, and. The interview is just incredible. Uh, oh, it's so, fascinating. Yeah. So fascinating. today we're gonna, yeah, today we're gonna go over a lot more about their biology and what researchers mm-hmm. and scientists like Dr. Barney Long, what they do know about them, and mm-hmm. what the conservation mm-hmm. issues are. And hopefully, you'll tune in on Thursday for this incredible interview. Uh, he is just very, very knowledgeable, and mm-hmm. I really. I was really moved by his overall, um, how do I say, like I mean, his not- overall viewpoint? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of, that's a good way. Yeah. Of these complex, really complex issues for critically endangered species, especially Asian species. It's what he specializes in, uh, and he has a really unique outlook and a really important outlook that um, that Chris and I. Uh, as much as we talk and mm-hmm. talk and talk about all this from him, he just says it in a much clearer, more concise way. Yeah. And he's yeah. obviously, he's been out in the field and really seen firsthand the, the issues right. uh, yeah. of what the Saula is facing. facing and, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm, and, and alongside a team of researchers, which we'll talk a lot more about mm-hmm. in the interview or a team of experts, I should say, mm-hmm. um, from all different dis- disciplines, they are working to save the Saula. Yeah. Hands on the, you know, boots Sal on the ground. La. Ha- Sal Sal la. I, Sal la. <laughs> I, I think I'm going to put it on my wall right yeah. now with like little amber Just sands think of a over pig. it. Think of pigs. Oink, oink. Oh, there Sal you go. La. That's what Sal I, that's la. how I did it. Okay. Yeah. That's good. Awesome. Okay. See, Chris, what would I they do don't look like you? pigs, but just think of a pig. They don't. They don't. <laughs> no, no. So yes, yes. Please, uh, please yeah. stay tuned today so you can learn about them and get fired up about them. They are just the oh, most it's mysterious, yeah, gorgeous just, it's hoof stock. Very. That I mean, I don't know. I, I don't want. I'd have to get the. Uh, they might be the prettiest. I mean, there are some good. I ones. see. I know the hoof stock for hoof stock. Yeah, they uh, for hoof stock. I will say they are up there for sure. Yeah, I mean, for, and, and, the sea dragons are just. Oh uh, yeah, well no, you're going. Yeah, you're, I mean. Yeah, the sea dragon, and then you know, and then then the naked mole rats, like right behind that, is <laughs> <laughs> uh, always coming in second. That darn naked yeah. mole rat, right? <laughs> uh, but no, it's it's oh, it's just a crazy fun species to to learn about the discovery. And this was what is really cool because it's super elusive. I know we talked about the elusive okapi, mm-hmm. 
But, you know, we've classified, I, I would say, almost every large mammal in Sure, Africa. and I think the Okapi, it, it would be, without looking at my notes or cheating and using yeah. Google, I think the Okapi was discovered yeah. in the 50s or 60s. So well, the, yeah, but they knew about it in like the 1800s, right? right? Like the, right. the way back when, because they did have, you know, this elusive copy. They had the the skeleton and and the, the right, skin yeah. I guess of I'm thinking it, the but, first time yeah. it was either like spotted, spotted or caught right? or whatever. Yeah, 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 yeah. So they've known about it for a while. This thing they didn't discover it until 1992. Yes, like just. Like what, twenty something years yes, ago? Yes, I mean, I was, ago, I was like just ago. born. Yeah. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> yeah, I wish. God, I wish. <laughs> I would be your. No, I, I think I, I was mind. like getting my driver's there. license um, or something. No, not quite. Not yeah, quite. I, my sister was driving. My sister yeah. was driving me around, and we were always late for school. Is going nineteen ninety two that long? Going ago? in ditches oh in Michigan oh winters because we, uh, the car yeah. she drove was ridiculous and big. And, re- and rear wheel drive. To say, I, mm-hmm. I don't remember 1992, but it's probably because I wasn't very sober. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. There's that. I was because I was a high school athlete, so I had to be very yeah, serious right. about my sports. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think I just quit football, so I, I was done. Anyways, okay. So yeah, but we're 1992, old. Um, right? So let's get back yeah. to Saula. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, you said it right. Um, Thank you. Largest mammal found in over 50 years. Yes. And, you know, taking this from National Geographic, it, they, they said it was probably one of the most spectacular zoological discoveries in the 20th century. Yes. Yes. Like, this is now, why I we're would getting go back excited. To... Team Saula. Yeah. Team Saula. I mean, but I think no, but, Titanoboa but, but, but nobody was knows one of the about cool it. ones, but yeah. That's, yeah. that's the problem. And uh, I yeah. don't want to blow the podcast load of what I usually get to in mm-hmm. the end, some of my pleas and conservation groups. Yeah. But, I mean, that is the problem is... I even loving hoofstock and Mm -hmm. anything with horns and antlers reading about it. This is still new. This animal I recently just learned about and probably the past five or six years reading, reading up more on national geographic and different things. So, right. I mean, if I missed out on this thing, I'm sure a lot of people like myself that love hoofs and horns and antlers or just large mammals in general or animal, gorgeous animals in general, probably have never heard Mm. about this. So, Please, please pause us right now. Go to our show notes or just go to Wikipedia yeah. and type in S A O L A. Is that right? Did I spell yeah. it right? Okay. Yeah. Yep, 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 yep. <laughs> I'm not looking yeah. at my notes. You got it right. You got it right. It's, it's late at yeah. night here for me. Um, yeah. And just, and we'll describe the picture of it, but then you can kind of get an idea of what we're mm-hmm. talking about before you turn Yeah, they are very turn pretty. Us off. They are gorgeous. <laughs> please don't turn us off. Nah, yeah. Yeah, no, no. I mean, it, it's this is probably going to be, you know, like I said, a shorter episode. Just there's not a lot known, but you know, we're going to do what we can and share with with what we do know. Now, I will say, you want to stay towards the end. Mm-hmm. You know, you don't want to turn us off because they call this the Asian unicorn, and I'm going to kind of talk a little bit about unicorn myths. And there was actually something in there that really surprised me, like where the first time somebody described. Oh, I don't know this. So, so, so we'll I'm going to I'm going to stay tuned. Yeah, <laughs> I'll be here. Yeah, and then I have a funny story. Funny story about cloning unicorns, but I'll, I'll save that okay. for the end. Um, awesome. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 one of my favorites. And then Angie, you know, when they were talking about the discovery, it was the, what the World Wildlife Foundation was right, working Chris, with so Vietnam. The the Sala story to me is a very incredible one as well, and not necessarily mm-hmm. your typical discovery. In that, in May of 1992, when I was driving around. The snowy roads with my sister, <laughs> going, with in no seatbelt seat. on, going in ditches. And my in a, no, yeah, when you were when you were in the baby yeah, seat you know. with your and mom my driving sister's around, 1978 right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. red two door yeah. Thunderbird, I think is what she had. It was ridiculous. Yeah. It was ridiculous. Oh wow! Okay. Anyhow, okay. Yeah, um, yeah. and you were playing football, or we don't know. We can't disclose on the air what you were I, doing. Yeah, well, some I, awesome yeah, I was scientists I was, yeah. <laughs> uh, from yeah. both the ministry of forestry in Vietnam and the World Wildlife Fund and a couple universities, I believe in that region of Vietnam Mm -hmm. or Laos, were sent to survey the biodiversity of a newly established park called the Vu Quang National Park. I'm sure I'm saying that wrong. No, no, I think it sounds right. (laughs) It's close. And so uh, on the 21st of May, the team came across a skull featuring a a strange pair of really long pointed horns from a local hunter. Mm -hmm. So from people in the region, a local hunter. 
And then interestingly enough, they came upon another pair, so it must be a skull, in the region of the mm -hmm. Anamite Mountain Range the following day in this mm -hmm, reserve. Mm -hmm. So obviously yeah. people started scrambling. Scientists got together. They do what they do. And yeah. basically by July 17th, 1992, the WWF, the World Wildlife Fund, announced the discovery of this new large mammal. And like you yeah, mammal. Like you said, yeah. the, the largest one in yeah. like 50 years or something. Mm -hmm. 50 years mm -hmm. that they found. And I don't know if we'll find one that big. You know, I mean... There's still some very remote regions, but to find something, and, and we're going to get to the size here in a second, but you know, it's, it, it's, it's a rather large animal. It's not as big as a Cape Buffalo, but sure. it, it's up there. Um, you know, and like you said, the discovery, they were talking about these straight horns. Saula actually means uh, spinning wheel post horn. So it has kind of like mm -hmm, a spiral, mm -hmm. right? That's kind yeah. of what it looks like a little bit, but I, you know, it, it, the, the thing is, like, it, it looks like an antelope, but it's related to cattle, which I'm going to get to more in a minute. And, you know, the way you described it to me when you talked about wanting to do this a couple weeks ago, you're like, it, I was it's like, like, please, Chris, this is my, yeah. I'm going to explode yeah. if I don't get to. Yeah. Get there. yeah. I, I'm, I'm like, if Dr. Long doesn't email me back, I'm, I am going to cry. But he did. He's, an, he's like one of the best <laughs> people I've yeah. ever interviewed. He's just so knowledgeable yeah. uh, they're all everybody yeah. i've interviewed has been amazing I guess sorry I, john somebody's got a crush now <laughs> i <laughs> mean crush. watch out leonardo uh this guy <laughs> actually emails me back <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but you told me it like looks like an oryx yes right? which yes, we're gonna yeah. eventually do mm -hmm. we'll do the arabian oryx and yes and... We, oh the arabian oryx yes i've been yeah. saved I, I i save all the ones that are the closest to my heart i, I like to keep my my cards close to my yeah. chest, but yes, we well, got to spread them out a little bit. Yes, too, and you know, we, I, I had to work with Arabian orcs, and so yeah. um, I loved Azba Jasmine mm -hmm. and some of the other ones. So they didn't try to kill you because you had to. Yes. Like, you couldn't go in with them, right? Because they will kill you. Yeah, they are tough. Um, I are, almost like, um, lost my yeah. baby making parts at one point. In time. Oh Jesus! Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, but God, I'll save that God. story for uh, and think uh, <laughs> that, that episode. Yes, yes. We didn't normally go uh, in with them, and then when we do go in with yeah. them, we would have a baffle board as a shield to protect us. Yeah. And they have long. For those yeah. of you who don't know what orcs horns look like, they look like saula horns, straight, narrow, and pointy. Mm -hmm. And yes, um, one of the gentlemen, Arabian orcs, was very upset with me and my coworker for telling him it was time to go inside for the night. And yeah. he came at us, which is fine. That's why you have the shield board protecting yourself. But my, my mm -hmm. board broke. Oh, shoot. <laughs> I must say mm -hmm. something else. Oh. Yes. Yeah. And a horn, and a horn yeah. came very close to going in between my legs and up. Oh, jeez. Oh, my God. However, my thing. buddy Jason, my knight in shining armor, <laughs> uh, protected me. He did some amazing yeah. Jedi, Star Wars. I don't even know what moves. <laughs> and he put the yeah. shield in front of me. So I was yeah. behind. And then we, we got the heck out of Dodge. Yes. And that, and I, I love that orcs. He was just a grumpy old man. Yeah, he, yeah. Uh, he stayed outside that night. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you're like, said, okay, you. <laughs> you win. <laughs> we'll yeah. leave you, you, we'll leave you access to the warm barn and you can decide yes. if you want to come in. But, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, anyways, yeah. I guess I won't tell that story when we do orcs. Uh, well, we'll do it again. We'll tell. Yeah, it again. So, yeah, yes. But yes. But you can yes. just imagine. So the horns are, yeah, they're like two. Well, scimitars, so that's what like, I always or, say: or a difference swords, between yeah. animal, you know, animals that have horns and or antlers are a little different than horses or other hoofstock animals that don't have them. That are true. I would yeah, horses and zebras are true flight mm -hmm. animals. If they get scared, mm -hmm. they're going to turn and run. They might kick out. Yeah obviously, yeah. but they're going to run where mm -hmm. typically a horned or an ant an animal antlers, when they're upset or scared or mad, they, instead of going the other way, they go towards what they're angry at or scared at. Mm -hmm. So they'll, mm -hmm. they're, they can be fear aggressive and they'll charge or this one. I mean, this guy, he knew what we were doing. He was just annoyed and pissed. Yeah. And he was like, I have horns yeah. and I'm, I'm, I'm awesome. <laughs> <You're> <laughs> Yeah, you're not going to make me do this. No. Yeah. yeah. So anyways, but. Um, but you're right. So like those horns are, are they have these really two long horns, both males and females. Correct. And, both males right, and females. Mm -hmm. And use as defense, right? Defensive against predators or maybe some sure. sparring with the males. Yeah. Between two males. Uh, I mean, with I think with a Saula, I mean, not to give too much of behavior away, mm -hmm. we'll talk more about what we mm -hmm. do know. 
I, I don't know if there's been enough uh, male-to-male interaction to know. Right. Yeah. Like no clue. If there is fighting or yeah. exactly how they specifically use their horns. But that can be right. presumed from looking at the uh, the family that they're related to, the different species, the species of antelopes and or uh, right. bovine animals that they're related right. to, to, to know. I mean, if you have a horn, that's – you use it. <laughs> and the saula horns – I believe they're going to be slightly shorter than probably an Arabian oryx horns, but they're mm-hmm. around, they're dark brown, black in color, and they're around 35 to 50 centimeters long. But okay. it's twice, so about twice the length of their head. So okay. good so size. Yeah, yeah. You yeah, don't want that thing size. coming at you. Mm-mm. No, 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 no. Now, their bodies are, I, I have like a red brownish coat. Chocolate brown, Chris. Chocolate yeah, brown? With a, okay. Yes, okay. with red highlights. Like, give me that yeah. color a hairstylist <laughs> hair. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then their face but, is gorgeous. They have yeah, patches. Ah, of... that is, yeah. Ah, man. Far. Chris and I are horse yeah. people, and then we would, these yeah. markings, we would just... Yeah, ah, crazy. Yeah. yeah, go crazy for in the horse world. But they have patches of white on their face and their throats and sides of their neck, mm-hmm. and a paler shade of brown on their neck and belly. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, yeah, and there's little splotches of white in their body somewhere, yeah. Oh, yeah. And then to even yeah, yeah. top everything off to make them the perfect, like, color-coded animal ever, they yeah. have a black dorsal stripe. So for those of you that yeah. don't know what a dorsal stripe is, it's a stripe that runs down basically, like, the back line. The spine. The spine. Yeah, mm-hmm. the spine. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, they're they're just – they are very gorgeous. I mean, they for the hoofstock, they are definitely Oh, they're stunning. They're striking. Yeah. And they also yeah. – interestingly yeah. enough, too, they have – um Max, uh, two maxillary glands or like sinus glands mm-hmm. underneath their eyes, if you will, for the most part. And they're used as scent glands and they have been observed rubbing, uh, rubbing this area on trees and other things. Mm-hmm. And the scent gland area, area that open up, they're like orbital type deals. They, mm-hmm. they have a thick, pungent, grayish green secretion that's. Mm-hmm. They'll basically put, you know, against vegetation and it leaves basically like a, a stinky paste that most likely the yeah. researchers <laughs> don't know, but either it's to yeah. show off how, you know, this is their territory yeah. or to attract yeah. other animals uh, or other, other potential mates. So they're not, they're not, they're mates, not sure. Yeah. But interestingly enough, Chris, this maxillary, maxillary gland on the saula is probably the largest among any other animal. So that's, I mean, yeah, that's kind of crazy, you know? And yeah, yeah, like I just, it, it, this, this animal is very unique. And, and when I get to the history of it, it, you know, as far as the natural history, it is really unique. The, as far as the size. So we say, you know, it's the largest mammal, but it's like 33 inches at the shoulder, like just a little bit under three feet. So they're not huge, mm-hmm. you know, no, or 83 centimeters uh, for the metric. They only weigh 175 to 220 pounds or 80 to 100 kilograms. So they're mm-hmm. not enormous. So that's why it's no, like what we it, say. It's, it is. It's, yeah. mm-hmm, it's similar to the Arabian orcs as far as size. I mean, I don't know specific yeah. measurements, but yeah, our guys that took care of um, at the zoo were, yeah, probably around yeah, three, 70, four feet. 80, 90. Yeah. Yeah, no, kilograms. probably not ninety kigs. Six, yeah. Sixty to eighty kigs, I would yeah. say kilograms. Yeah. Um. And but that's so that was always the joke. I'm like, I hear I work with all these really large, big hoofstock yeah. animals, tachins and zebras and mm-hmm. Bactrian camels. Mm-hmm. He just huge. And I and I and, and yes, the one that was going to injure me the most was this <laughs> was little this little feisty, this little you know, 140 pound, you know Horse. what. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, but yeah, tough yeah. as nails. Tough honey badger. Nails. Honey badger is still yeah, my favorite. Totally. Still totally. my favorite. So, you know, it's it, we're going to get to the range here too. You you said Vietnam. It's like really why care about just a, a stupid hoofed animal? Which, I mean, sorry, Angie, don't kill me. If I was like in the same room, Angie would have just smacked me. I, I mean, I'm you just trying see to see be... my face. You should see my no, face I, right now. I don't think they're stupid. I, you know, I love them. I'm just saying, like, if somebody said, hey, well, well, I care about the Saula. Let's just, you know, let them go. Why are we going to spend millions? Like, what do you think? I mean, I think because it's a large mammal on the brink. Like, we need to, We, I mean, the frog's just as important. But again, like, it's it's a it's an issue that you and I go back and forth on in the news program. We've discussed it before. You know, flagship species or, you know, if we can protect the Saula, what else can we protect in that biome? That's my take. But I know you are really passionate about this. So I'm interested to hear what you have to say. Sure. I'm still trying to undistort my face. and. <laughs> No, I mean, oh, I was just saying if some, 
No, I, else. Chris, I'm totally not me. Using. No, no, this is good. I love them. This is good. And this is obviously my interview with um, Dr. Long too. We, we, t- we touched on this of, uh, of why, why I care about the sala and why I put this money into it um, mm-hmm. and to saving them and all this energy when their numbers are, then they're critically endangered and their numbers are very, very low. Their populations are fragmented. And there's several reasons, um, in my opinion, and also listen to the interview too. You can get his, he's, he's an expert. So his, his answers come off a little bit more robust than mine, but basically Chris, I think that the Saula is the flagship species for the Anamite region for Vietnam and Laos, this mountain range. It is one of the, obviously one of the larger mammals, if not the largest mammal, because I think, uh, tigers and rhinos that used to be in that area years ago have been uh, poached. So they're, they're no longer there and the habitat that's been protected by the governments. And we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more uh, and what's Mm -hmm, what conservation mm -hmm. actions are being taken place, but they're working to really preserve. There's a, a good amount of natural habitat that's under, under preservation and the governments are doing what they can to try to help save this animal. Well, and Chris, this Anamite range uh, that the Saula are found mm-hmm. are is home to really rare creatures that have also recently been discovered. There's the Anamite rabbit, of course, the Saula, the Dauk, I'm probably pronouncing that wrong, a species of Langer. <laughs> I'll just make it easy. And obviously we're fans mm-hmm. yeah, of Langers yeah, on this podcast, as we've talked about the cat bob before. So this is mm-hmm. the D-O-U-C mm-hmm. Langer, the large guar, the Chinese pangolin, we've done pangolin before, and the Indo-Chinese mm-hmm. tiger, mm-hmm. which I think is typically, I think it's been removed from that area, but, but maybe I could be wrong. But in general, right. that's the range. Yeah. And so by protecting this range from poachers and from deforestation, and human basically encroachment, you're protecting many species. And they've also recently discovered in the 1990s, three species of muntjac, which is a super charming little antelope, oh, yeah. uh, very, a, lot, a lot smaller. Mm-hmm. But they have the, they've discovered the leaf muntjac, the trung sun muntjac, and the giant muntjac. So conservations with the mysterious unicorn, the saula, are going to trickle down and inevitably help all of these creatures right. I just mentioned. Yeah. And, and I think we don't, I think there's other things to be discovered in this range, which. Right. Yeah. Maybe Sasquatch. I don't know. <laughs> right. Maybe. <laughs> so, no. So, you know, the, yeah, they range in, you know, so the Vietnam and Laos, a little bit in Laos, you, which you've said. So these Anamite mountains, you know, heavily forested, but reading this about the Sala where they find them, they don't find them like on the peaks. They prefer more of the Midlands. Right, mm-hmm. the rivers and valleys is where they do, and then they think they do migrate down to the lowlands sometimes. Sure. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so they're not, uh, you know, but it's rare for them to be in the lowlands, and probably because of human, you know, activity and things like that have probably pushed them up a little bit. But yeah, and they, it's like, especially for for Americans, you know, the, the horrific Vietnam War. It's like more North Vietnam, right. Okay, not the South Vietnam. South Vietnam is where like a lot of the fighting was, and and you know if there was any there, I'm sure they died or whatever, got driven out by the war. But this is more in North Vietnam and, and the border with Laos. So yeah, and um, it's I'm just... sure the I'm sure the war had some effect on them. I mean, I'm not being like oh, you know, that whole region was devastated. Right, but, but this is luckily, just, I mean, uh, this is really rugged, mountainous terrain. Yes, yeah, and it has it's it's climatically wet evergreen mm-hmm. broadleaf forest habitat mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and they have basically a 10 month long rainy season 10 months yeah, like always it's always raining it's right. worse like, than seattle yeah, yeah. i mean exactly <laughs> as i was in florida we our summers consider our rainy season but yeah. it's like what yeah. three months long so yeah. i mean and, and they get up to uh and there's no month that receives less than 40 millimeters of rain wow Oh. And they have monsoons. And so a lot of this helps dictate the Saula habitat, probably some of the other critters that are mm-hmm. living there too. And the distribution of the Saula spans more than 450, 500 kilometers in this rugged mm-hmm. terrain. And so I think that that's why it. a lot of these species are just recently being discovered because it's just so remote. And when mm-hmm. I say discovered, 
once again, I mean by Western, Western researchers and right. scientists. Yes. Obviously, and when I get to behavior, most of what we know about the Saula is from the locals. Yeah, the indigenous people that have lived around them. Like, oh, yeah, we've known about these forever. But it's, the, like you said, the science and the people that, you know, the zoologists, things like that, that have yeah, found, and I think, found these species. Right. And I think, Chris, the other thing, the, another reason to really care about this animal, in my opinion, mm -hmm. is besides it's big and gorgeous and it's like a flagship species for this region. Uh, but it's been mysterious. Like we, you and I keep saying mysterious, but mm -hmm. just to give the listeners a background and Dr. Long will talk a little bit more about it. And since the discovery of the Saula in 1992, there have not been many interactions with Westerners and the Saula. Mm -hmm. It's been kept under human care multiple times, but only for short periods. And each time it was under human care, unfortunately, it passed away pretty quickly within like three months just be because right. being cared for by the locals, and this was before Westerners were brought in with expertise, mm -hmm. uh, it just, it couldn't thrive. And so, or they couldn't right, thrive. Right. And, and so most of what scientists and researchers are going on as far as habitat and distribution are from camera traps. So... Mm -hmm. Most scientists that have worked with this species have never seen a live one. Right. They're just, <clears throat> it's like, you know, the Akapi. So it's, it's really, it's elusive. like a mystery. Yeah. Super elusive. Yeah. And of course, in these, and just a lot of it's like getting the money and the resources, resources together to even try to find the, these guys in this remote well, and evergreen, I mean, ever wet just, forest. Just to jump ahead a little bit to, you know, we should almost say like in the beginning, critically endangered there, there could be as few as 25, like IUCN thinks. So yeah, if you populations that low, the chances are of, of seeing them is really remote. But I think the high estimate is like what seven fifty is what IUCN had listed. Yeah, you know, so. they, I mean they definitely know there's because of the camera traps. Yeah. They know there's there's pockets of them. Uh, but but the camera traps too had they haven't um, until currently, and we'll get to that. They haven't really invested too much money into the camera traps yeah. and all the different locations. So honestly, yeah. the the Saula's only been caught on camera traps a handful of times in mm -hmm. 1998, 1999, 2013, mm -hmm. and this is. A combination of many factors. Basically, they don't. We don't understand the ecology of it. Is yeah, it nocturnal? Yeah. Is it not? Is I mean, we have they have guesses, but right. they don't really understand a lot about what does. Which that understanding an animal's ecology is what affects camera trap placement. So you know where mm -hmm. to put them, and then also too, it's it's just so hard to conduct these intensive studies because of the dens density of this of like you said, the lack of numbers of these animals yeah. and where they live. Right, and right. Well, we're going to touch more about this. I'll probably definitely get in my soapbox. But it, when it's not about the money, it's about, it's about the, money. the money. It's always so, about the money. So once again, they haven't really been able to dump a lot of resources into trying to, quote unquote, do population counts or – or see these animals, right? And and do be yeah. like, I mean, obviously, you know me, if, uh, man. If I could, I would sit in that evergreen forest with my raincoat. Yeah, my, my, I get look, some nice yeah. rain gear from like North Face yeah. or Patagonia or something, <laughs> and I would just give <laughs> me the there. Jane Goodall oh, of the Sala. Man, I would just yeah. love to take notes on its behavior, do my yeah. scan sampling with my little yeah, my little yeah. watch going beep beep. Yeah, yeah. And I'd be like, yeah, oh, yeah, it's yeah. eating next time, eating. Yeah. Sleeping. That's all it does. Walking. Yeah. That's all. But I, <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I, that would be like the coolest thing ever. But there just yeah. hasn't yeah. been the, I don't want to say the interest, definitely interest, but yeah. just basically the funding yeah, to, to, under, to, to, to understand that enough mm -hmm. ecology to even know where to go looking for this thing. Now, they, but they do have, they do have ideas and, and they, they think pockets, they think there's pockets of anywhere from zero to 20 animals and probably 20 different pockets. So that's where you get your number of anywhere from, 25 to 600 or something like that. Um, but mm -hmm. they just don't know, uh, for sure. Yeah. And that's where, and so I guess when we get, you know, to, to round out the whole story of why care is it would be really, really sad if this animal, if nobody could be the Jane Goodall for Saula and understand it and, and this creature goes extinct within 30 years of it being discovered by Westerners, basically. Because yeah, people yeah, didn't act yeah. enough. There wasn't enough fun. There wasn't enough interest Quick because enough. it's not a, you know, it's not, 
a rhino or well, a lion I, or a, yeah, you know, an orangutan or something like that. And with, you know, one of my first interviews, it, it just always sticks with me. Niaga Leonard, when he was talking about, you know, Vietnam has a lot of challenges of, sure. you know, government and they're trying they have this emerging economy and they're pushing to grow. So when it comes to conservation in certain areas, it gets really hard to, to get done. Sure. So, sure. but yeah, I mean, they're, they're, they're interesting, Angie. I mean, they, they really call this one unique and, you know, you, even before we started recording, we were talking about some of the natural history and you said they thought they used to be an antelope, but after doing genetics, they actually believe it's more related just to the cow. So. Right. I know. Yeah. See, that's, yeah, it's, gosh, you gotta love science. I would. Yeah, a hundred percent. I would have called it the Saula antelope if I yeah, was naming it, yeah, or the Angie yeah. antelope, the cutie patootie yeah. antelope, the, <laughs> it's, the, it's, okapi, it is, the, the Asian okapi antelope. No, or, you know, that's I, what you would think. Yeah, you would yeah. think. And so, like, they're 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 a bovid. So mm-hmm. we talked about this in Cape Buffalo. The ten tribes of of bovids. You you know, we have the bovini, which is your buffalo and cattle, and that's where the the Saula is. Then you also, you know, I mean, out of the other ones, you have the antelopes. I mean, most of them are all antelopes. Impala, wildebeest, oryx, goats and sheep, caprini. That's where they usually thought they were. They were caprini, sheep and goats. Doing DNA analysis, they are like, no, it actually is really closely related to buffalo and cattle. So almost like, you know, the, uh, what, the mountain Anoa is one that, you know, or the Asian water buffalo. I don't know. I, I would assume maybe one day they'll be able to to flush this out, but it well, actually is his own genus, it, yeah, right? It's... It, yeah. I mean, well, and the, the cool thing about this, well, there's so much, one yeah. of the cool things from me prove is that about the Saula is it does differ. It that it differs significantly from all other bovid genre. And yeah. like you said, in the morphology. Uh, and so it, yeah, it's in its own genus and the genus is called pseudo orx, which I can pronounce that. Hey, there you I, go. I don't hey, think yeah, I yeah. can. Can you say that the scientific yeah, name yeah, of yeah. the Saula? <laughs> I'm going to try because this is like my favorite species yeah, yeah, that yeah, we've go, go, done, go. I don't yeah, know, yeah. in a, forever. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to try. So, Pseudoorx, yeah. Nagitin Hennesis. <laughs> horrible. Like that was horrible. American I should be fired. No, uh, yeah, I think you, the end, the end, I think is silent. So, I put Edin Hennesis or Hensis. It's not Hennesis. It's so Et Jet. So, it's, it's NG8. H E T. Yes, so, listeners, we are so not drinking. Like it is, it Jet is very in hard to pronounce. Jet, yeah, why didn't you? You got to call Doctor Long and say, "Hey, how do we say yes. this?" Oh, you know, he's, um, if he's listening. He's laughing. He, Jet, he, Jet and Hensis. He, like yeah. he gave me a. He teased me a lot about my my yeah, American horrible pronunciation of. For I think for the first half of the interview, Sayola. I called it Sayola. <laughs> like I was like you did you did like I was like I, I was, well I. I can speak Spanish is my second language. So it's a romantic language yeah. You pronounce things the way that they look. So that's how I was pronouncing it. Right, right. I guess I forgot we were over in Asia. And anyways, the nice gentleman didn't correct me until I asked him. I, he probably wouldn't have corrected me the whole yeah. interview, but then, he, then, then of course he, yeah, he kind of, uh, he opened up and joke. teased yeah, me, yeah, which yeah. is awesome. Like, please tease me. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Yeah, 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 but yeah. yeah. So, but the pseudo orcs means obviously false orcs. Like it's not, you know, mm-hmm. it's not a cousin of the orcs. Yeah. What you would think? Yeah. yeah, no, that's good. Yeah, that's good. You did good on. Thank you, that one. thank we you. Both failed yes. at the yeah, one. the other one. Forget about it. We'll put it in the show notes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yes, yeah, so you can look at it there. So, I mean, Angie, like, you know, we trying to find as much info. There's just not a lot here. You know, like life cycle. I we don't know I, how you know, long I, it lives. I we don't compare... know what it smells, yeah. what its eyesight. We don't know how fast it runs. No, no. Uh, no. I mean, I, I. I looked up age in some other bovids, like pronghorn antelope lived 10 to 15 years. Cape buffalo. So that would be a ballpark years. with most of them that I've yeah. worked with in that like antelope. 20 years, yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah. yeah. The Anoa is 20 years. But we don't years, know. So like, I mean, yeah, we, we don't know. We don't know. Yeah, and they how, could be much What, what a that. shame that would be, right? I mean, yeah. to not find that out. And like you said, they're they're either crepuscular or nocturnal. So that's when they've caught them on camera traps, you know, moving around. So yes and no. Um, okay. so most, most of what we know about the Saula comes from knowledge of the local communities in the area. There you go. There you go. And no one's conducted, basically, nobody's done the Jane Goodall, my dream job, ethological mm-hmm. studies mm-hmm. of these species, and no scientist has seen one in the wild. 
Okay. So biologists and some special individuals, researchers, when they were under human care, was a were able to study them. Mm -hmm. And a researcher by the name of William Robichaud, I'm probably pronouncing that wrong. Sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, he is, uh, he was able to study them when they're living, you know, caught up by locals. And so, so, so mm -hmm. he has a lot of notes and he's, for the past 20, 30 years, he's been basically the main dude fighting for these guys and helping kind of arrange a lot of the organization and mm -hmm. a lot of the organization and the movement to save this species, to save the Saola, to save the Saola, sorry, to save the Saola. Saola. And, Good. But so some of his notes show that the female was actually active during the day, uh, but that okay. keep, you know, he's obviously a good researcher. So he pointed out that that could have been that she was in unfamiliar mm -hmm. surroundings. Right. You know? Right. And yeah, it's like, what am I doing here? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And one of the notes that I love so much uh, is that when she rested, when the female Saula rested, she would draw her forelegs inward to her belly and extend her neck mm -hmm. so that her chin touched the ground <laughs> and close her eyes. Oh, so like a dog, you know, or a cat. Yeah. It's just yeah. so, yeah, yeah, so precious. I'm like, okay, we need to see that. All yeah. right. Like, yeah, yeah. I need, I need to see that. Whether it's on, you know, a National Geographic video yeah. or World Wildlife Fund video, like, I need that. Just that. Yeah. Because, is so I mean, oh, I, you know, I, I haven't done a lot on cattle behavior or bovid behavior, but I know, like, you know, just with, with horses that, you know, their sleeping behavior, they sleep sta most of the time, sleep standing upright. Sure. Very Horses rarely will they, they'll, they'll take cat naps quickly on the ground, but they, you know, or in sun themselves, but generally they don't. So it's interesting. Yeah. Well, I mean, horses have way. a state. Yeah. They have a state mechanisms in their legs, basically yeah. kind of lock them in the standing position when, when they take their little cat naps. So then that yeah. way, if a, yeah. you know, if a predator, came theoretical on, lions yeah. after them, they can just start running. Yeah. They don't have to like actually stand up. So, yeah, I mean, I think we don't know. We don't yeah, know. We don't know. And, and, I, I don't think they know if it's a, rudo, a ruminant or a pseudo ruminant. Yeah. Um, but what they think is that it, the saula is apparently solitary, mm -hmm. but from some of the locals, they've been reported in groups of two or three mm -hmm. and even up to six or seven. And so researchers think that that might pattern either the bushbuck or the Noah or the Sitatunga, mm -hmm. which are all hoofstock animals. Um, so, and of course, a, a mom and a and a calf will stay together, yeah, yeah, obviously, yeah, yeah, but they yeah. don't know for how long. And just you know, quickly, they just browsers, right? So like they, and, and you know a lot about this. They go around just chewing leaves and ferns and different plants uh, sure. around, right? Because it's not grasslands; they're living in a deep forest. So correct, selectively correct. Yeah. grazing, right? Yeah. So they're, I mean, obviously, or selectively they're browsing. Yeah. yeah, they're definitely herbivores, and they're thought to probably be a browser because mm -hmm. of the like you said there's no grass right it's all mm -hmm. this dense leafy vegetation but i don't know if it's necessarily actually been categorized for sure because they just don't know enough about don't it don't know but, yeah yeah but um william robichaud did observe that um the female could extend her tongue up to 16 centimeters or 6.3 inches to reach her eyes and upper part of the face yeah <laughs> So, yeah. so I thought so it's like cute. the Okapi, right? Because if we talk about the Okapi, yeah, doing that, like right. the Okapi yeah. can clean their it's, ears, you mm -hmm, know? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. So this one can clean yeah. out those, those sticky orbitals or this, the yeah. this maximized yeah. scent glands. And yeah. he also reported that the upper surface of the tongue was covered with fine backward pointing barbs, probably for grooming. Mm -hmm. And, and of course, being a good researcher that he was along with others, they, you know, they reported what types of plants, um, that they fed in shrubs and trees that they fed the animal and what she seemed to, she seemed to like a lot of them Enjoy, and, yeah. and that mm -hmm. the, the feeding mainly occurred during the day and rare, rarely at dark. So, but once mm -hmm. again, is that just because of her situation or is that, you know, we just don't know. And interestingly enough, I keep saying, I should have said this in the beginning, darn it. Um, her, uh, one of the ones that was highly studied, her name was Martha. Okay. <laughs> So Martha the yeah. Saula is one of the basically lead examples that we have of how of what they mm -hmm. did, and what the uh, William Robichaud also report Robichaud Robichaud also reported that this female um, mm -hmm. living under human care was 
calm in the presence of humans. Like they seem really peaceful, unlike an Arabian orcs or a sable antelope that mm-hmm. I worked with that mm-hmm. are trying to kill you. <laughs> yeah, I, I like to say it a little more politically correct. It's fear aggressors. Yes. So when they get scared, they like yes. charge. So they didn't, this is um, Martha and others that have been, you know, uh, living under human care until they passed away. Uh, seemed similar like they were much more peaceful mm-hmm. and just kind of just relaxed like I, I, maybe how i mm-hmm. picture an okapi i don't know if that's i don't know we'd have to ask jesse but the okapis were pretty yeah chill, right? yeah i think like, they're like I, yeah. pretty just like chill yeah. and so but they did yeah. report that or he did report that um she did have an encounter with a dog and then she would rest- resort to like snorting and thrusting her head forward and pointing her horns mm-hmm. at the opponent and like she was going to get him she had her ears backwards yeah. and an arched back and stood stiff. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. yeah, they don't know, you know, the, they're like, okay, well, you know, what's going on here? But some researchers suggest that this might be because the fear reaction to dogs could be a consequence of evolving alongside um, a dole, which historically mm-hmm. would a D H O L E. Do you know what a dole is? I, uh, I'm trying to rack my brain. No. Okay, me neither. Let me Google it. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I do know. No, it's, I believe it's a wild dog. So that would be my oh, okay. my okay. million dollar okay. guess if I had to guess. Um, ha, kind of. It's a it's a uh, canid? a canid. Mm-hmm. Okay. So okay. it's an Asiatic wild dog. Boom! Look at me. I yes. So it's also known as the Indian dog, Indian wild dog, whistling mm-hmm. dog, red dog, mountain wolf. But cool. there are no. Um, they are no longer – they're also endangered. I don't – they're no longer yeah. in that area. Obviously, they've been either poached okay. or whatever. Uh, but it could be – you know, that was probably a main predator. And so – and maybe they're still in the area. I yeah, know. that – I mean, like you said, yeah. And then you even said like tigers. Like tigers are probably no Correct. longer there. But they've – they definitely – like in their history of evolution, mm-hmm. the predator, like top predator for them probably would have been, you know – a. a Sure, a big of cat, course. A tiger, mm-hmm. you know, then, you know, clouded leopards. I'm like, eh, maybe if they're in that area, could take down a small one, but mm-hmm. probably not a bigger one. And then you have these, these canids that, that were probably after them. So I, I mean, you know, just know what we know about behavior. I imagine like they are elusive. It's not like they, you know, which is weird because the Okapi has that, those back stripes mm-hmm. and, you know, to blend in. So I guess that face pattern might well help in these too, dense like jungles, cause I, yeah, in these the dense jungles, spots. it probably does yeah. somehow the dark contrasted with the light, you know, chocolate brown with yeah. the white. So they have darker coats and and it's tree trunks, right? So it's not like it's just one big green yes. from top to bottom. Right. So it's you have a lot of tree lines. trunks mm-hmm. that are brown. Yeah, yeah, and with some dead leaves and stuff. So yeah, so probably yeah, you know. Probably, so if you think about behavior of other animals, it probably does apply to them. Sure. But we just don't yeah, know. Yeah. And so, and really, so, I mean, one of the yeah. only other reports that I could find, I'm sure there's more out there, but uh, with uh, yeah. with Robichaud was that he did say that Martha would spend considerable time grooming herself with her strong tongue. And then, of course, she did some of the marking behavior where she would open up the flap of the maxillary gland and leave this, you know, stinky, thick secretion on rocks and vegetation. Yeah. And the only vocalization that I could find is that she would give out short bleats occasionally. And of course, Chris, regarding the reproduction, there's very little information out there about the sow. So they're not like sea dragons or seahorses, the the males. I mean, maybe. No, (laughs) I don't think so. I don't think so. I doubt it. But but we don't know what the role of the dad is. So he could be really involved or he could be deadbeat. No, I doubt it. Because because of the family that he's in, most. They're in most likely deadbeat, but whatever. The, yeah, yeah, and yeah. the moms yeah. seem, you know, hopefully are good moms, seem to be good moms. But they yeah. do think that the mating season might be fixed from late August to mid November. Of course, single calf births have been documented in the mm-hmm. summer from April to late June. And they don't know gestation period, but they're guessing about 33 weeks, similar to other, other, yeah, cousins that they're related Bobids, to. Bobids, yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's about all we have. So. That's about all we have. And that's <laughs> so, it, folks. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. I 
you know, like we I mean, said, they, they, clearly they I need to, to be some, there yeah. studying these things. I think that's what this all yes, this, yes. this this sign has taught me. This podcast has taught me. Like, holy shnikes, how, when how we, do we not know anything about this big we, stock animal? Oh my goodness. Hi, yeah, 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 I think what we need to do is we need to get a you know benefactor, and we need to go and go to the go in the field. Me and you, you know, take John and the kids. We need to make Leonardo DiCaprio care about Saula. Yeah, but no, but I mean, like, we could go and do a podcast on Saula there in Vietnam. Then we pack up and go to Africa, to Kenya, and or and go well, see I'd your Grevy Zebra. You I, well, okay, you got me there. You got. I was almost going to say no, I knew no. that's what I needed. You go to Africa. Yeah. I'll stay with the Saula. But when you said yeah. Grevy Zebra, I'm like, yeah, ding, yeah. ding, ding. And then we'll yeah. go down and do the, the, the rhino orphanage, and we'll still have to pry you away. Uh, yeah, I don't think yeah. I would ever... <laughs> be able to be right away from there <laughs> like oh, we'll give you a job man. you know and and yeah Jeez. you would never leave you would never leave <sighs> so yeah these guys critically endangered it's you know like we said 25 to 750 they know their populations are decreasing yeah obviously the population is decreasing and the reason we know this is because they're not seeing any on the camera traps they're going to put more camera traps out and keep looking for them but the biggest threat to these poor little cute oh, they're not little to these medium-sized hoofstock right. gorgeous saula are humans it's poaching but not in the traditional sense for like meat or medicinal use it's mm -hmm. the use of snares and right. i won't spend too much time going into it because a uh, dr barney long my interview uh on thursday he does a brilliant job of educating myself. Uh, so hear it from him firsthand since he's been over there. He's seen the snares. And what a snare is, is basically like you know, traps and animals up, right? Uh, it traps their leg up or something. They get caught. And mm -hmm, then, mm -hmm. then the poacher comes and... That's it. Yeah. Is yeah. that right? Yeah. Right? That's a, Is that a decent description? Yeah. Yeah. Or, I mean, yeah. Yeah. I think so. I mean, or, you know, the poor animal just dies. Right. Right. Know, yeah. And then, and then, and it. then basically yeah. the, the person poacher comes and takes it. But what's happening in this region of Vietnam and Laos is that, um, like Chris and I have talked about before, in, in this region, there's a booming, uh, after the wars and whatnot, there's a booming middle class. And so, with that being said, there's, a crazy high demand for wildlife meat uh, mm -hmm. in this area for the middle class and mm -hmm. not, not necessarily for Saula uh, at all. Um, yeah, honestly, it's for animals that are found in these woods for the rabbits that are found there, the mud Jack, the, uh, the rat, mm -hmm. um, Penguin. yeah, I mean, anything, yeah. It's obviously exotic to us, but to them, it'd be like in the United States, it'd be like us, like wanting to eat, you know, be like raccoon and possum and duck, duck and yeah, uh, well, well, yeah, yeah. Or, <laughs> and and just like meats that. Don't you have some? Don't you have some relatives that like eat squirrels? Oh no, my no, <laughs> my grand, my grandfather definitely <laughs> had. I mean, besides the amazing venison recipes yeah, he had, he, yeah. I think there was definitely some. Um, that I, I think good, there's definitely some saying, squirrel like, something possum, for sure. Yeah. yeah, yeah, for sure, or turtle or something. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah. but no, but so yeah. what's happening is that this demand for just exotic meat, so non-domestic, not cow, chicken, mm -hmm. what have you, fish, uh, mm -hmm. is just crazily killing off any creature, wildlife, wildlife. and the animites. Yeah. In fact, they're calling it, a, there's a term, it's been called the empty forest, uh, and mm. what is happening is even though a lot of these reserves are, are like are really heavily backed by the Vietnamese and Laos governments, uh, they just they just mm -hmm. can't keep up with it. They so certain conservation groups, the ones that I'll mention here in a minute, have have removed more over like close to thirty thousand snares. Okay. Wow. Okay. Wow. Have been removed from Saula yeah. habitat by conservation. Yeah, and, and I guarantee you that's like a, a drop in the bucket. Right. Like, you know, right. And so, yeah. I mean, they're basically described as when you walk, even though this is like super remote now, of course, because of humans and stuff, roads are starting to go through these mountains and these ranges and stuff, yeah. just because that's just what people do. Um, yeah. That there is like a snare can be found, you know, every five or 10 meters, basically. Like it's just mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. crazy. Insane. It's insane. And that's so. Insane. It's, I mean, it's uh, the medicinal stuff that we've talked about before. It's, it's, that's really not the mm -hmm. Saula's problem. 
Um, it's and and honestly, like I don't think the poachers even really care to even catch up one of these guys. It's just they're they're basically mm-hmm. bycatch from them from the poachers trying right. to get wild boar, rabbits, just whatever mm-hmm. that they can sell on the market because it's because I right. guess it's trendy. That's the demand. Yeah, there's a demand. Yeah. So yeah, it's it's just it's crazy. And um and Dr. Dr. Long does does it justice um and t- describing the situation over there. But just to give our there is some good news. Uh, commercial logging in the areas has been stopped in certain areas so Mm -hmm. and so there's an and and some parts there's ban on forest clearing so it's not really the habitat these animals have plenty of habitat especially with their small numbers um it's more you know once again it's more these snares and traditionally the local hunters right the people living in the area would hunt saula but because of Mm -hmm. conservation groups actually their attitudes towards the saula are changing and the scientific community has actually motivated hunters to stop hunting them and even look for live specimen to help scientists. So the locals are kind of on board. The locals are not the one doing the the snaring. It's the people that come in from the lowlands that, that want money. It's just all about money. Right. Right. So, well, it's, you know, it's, it's I just I just want to highlight this because this is I think such a critical point when we think of conservation when we think of you know the globally from South America to New Zealand to Africa to Asia it's you know from the United States we can say mm-hmm. we care about this and 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 many people do and many people donate tons of money many people travel and donate, you know, like I, we brought him up, Niaga Leonard. He's from the right. States, but now he lives in Vietnam. So there is that that movement. But what you're saying is so critical, getting the locals sure. invested in and, the conservation of that species. And we talked about the research right. with Snow Leopard in Nepal. Like the reason they're being protected is because yes. the locals now care. So I think that is such a major critical issue. That's how we Yeah, and I, and I think that fights. the conservation groups are doing – it sounds like, of course, more can be done. I mean, and they're going to be doing more. But it, mm-hmm. but the local people are starting to see that it's it's actually the it's a lot of like the non locals that are coming in, basically stripping their resources for you know for money and right because in the government too, a lot of times it's like, well, the government's not doing enough, and I'm sure the government can do more. But basically, in um, mm-hmm. Vietnam and Laos, it's illegal to hunt the saola, uh, even outside of its protected areas. So it's like they're, you know, they're doing, they're doing some stuff, but as Dr. Long talks about in the interview, it's, it's like you said, doing every, doing all those pieces of the puzzle and doing it harder and doing it more. Mm -hmm. And Mm so other really positive thing going for the Saula and Saula conservation is my first organization that please, anybody who was listening, I need you to go to Facebook like right now, yesterday, um, and check out the Saula Working Group. They're on Facebook. They can be found at Saula Working Group, or they can also be found at www.savethesaula.org. This is a group of about 35 experts. So Dr. Long, of course, is in this group. And he, he explains a lot more of that on our, in the interview. So it's very informative, very interesting. And they're like a coalition that includes these experts. They can be from field biology, law enforcement, community-based conservation, animal husbandry. See, I could fit in somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> or, uh, or biological resources from, of course, the uni- universities in Vietnam and Laos. Angie, and, I think you and, would fit in anywhere. But yeah, I, th- oh, I think these, thanks, are, your, these are your I know peeps. somebody like... Somebody please hire me. Oh, uh, no, um, but yeah. And then, and then of course, groups from the Wildlife Conservation Society, World Wildlife Fund, mm-hmm. just experts, right? Like all the awesome men and women that, mm-hmm. that have been, you know, working with or on this animal for the past 20, 30 years. And they do a lot of things. They have a lot of missions, a lot of goals. Uh, they, of course, work with locals for education. They do camera, tra- camera traps, documentation of the population, of course, is a primary focus. Um, they're even interested in looking at, this is a, you'll like this. Mm-hmm. They're interested in looking at leeches. Okay. 
because it's really wet and rainy there. So I right, use a lot right. of leeches, right? Yeah. Um, and leeches can store DNA. For oh yeah, months. yeah, okay, okay, okay. Yeah. That's... So they're they you know it's part of a mystery, right? Where they're trying yeah. to find out where they are and right. what they're doing, and so the leeches might tell the story. So just they're yeah, just cool. I mean at this that's point cool. in the game yeah. they're being yeah super clever and they're like all these yeah. brilliant people and I would love to be in the room with all of them and just shake their hands and um but yes so the Saula working group is working their butts off to save the Saula from extinction. Okay. Mm -hmm. And they are doing some really progressive besides all the stuff with the locals and the governments and mm -hmm. uh, anti poaching and they remove snares and just a busy group of people. They do this all for free, all voluntary. Mm -hmm. They all have real jobs, other places. Um, but, but now they're uh, turning up the heat and uh, Dr. Long and I talk a lot about that in the interview and they have a new goal of basically trying to save the Saula from extinction by um, doing a really challenging task, trying to find out where they live and bring any remnants that they can find into human care in Vietnam. And then they're, so they're basically building a huge controlled, um, right. uh, zoo is not the right word, uh, basically like a, uh, a research center, uh, a research I slash yeah. sanctuary center where, mm. where they can live safely away from these snares and repopulate. And then eventually in the future, if everything calms down with the wild meat trade and poaching, that then they, obviously they can be re-released. Uh, because mm -hmm. once again, they have, unlike a lot of other species, they have the land. The land is not the problem. Right. That's the problem for most species, right. right, is the land, like habitat yeah, destruction, yep. deforestation, yeah, blah, blah. Yeah, yeah, getting pushed out. These yeah. guys have it. They're just being snared to death. And so right. the Salo Working Group is is taking on this mission, and can they save this animal from extinction? I believe they can if they have enough funding. So I don't normally right. always, always do this, it, but yeah. – I'm doing this today, Chris, um, and you can edit out if you don't agree with me, but I, no, no, if you no, are listening no. first and foremost, if you don't have a dollar, I get it. Uh, but you can at least go to Facebook yeah. and like, and like their Facebook page. It's called the Saula working group. And they only, Chris, I checked it today. They only have 344 likes. Yeah. We have more than well, that. I think we, I think I we actually have, him. do we have more than that? Which is ridiculous. <laughs> like, like we're not, yeah, we're not yeah, doing the cool yeah, stuff yeah, that yeah. they're doing. Maybe someday, right? They now have three hundred forty. Thank you, Chris. I just posted. This. And <laughs> maybe you should you put go. this part at the beginning of the podcast. Yes. Like, seriously, be uh, I'll, because they, yeah, I will highlight. They it, yeah, have sure. newsletters. I was reading their newsletters. That's what I was doing all day. Like just trying to learn more about mm -hmm. these guys. Um, or you can go obviously to their website, save the org. You can click the donate button. You should, mm -hmm. um, even if it's every dollar helps, because yes, they they cannot save these yes. guys without money, and and it's not it's not it doesn't fall on the listener's shoulders. It doesn't fall on your shoulders or my shoulders. It mm -hmm. there every little bit helps, but there are some zoos that are donating big time to helping save the mm -hmm. saula. And in fact, to date, 13 North American zoos and affiliated or organizations have given a total of close to $100,000 U.S. While European zoos are kicking our bum, good for them, and they've give they've given close yeah. to $300,000 U.S. Okay, and now some of the zoos and organizations that have pledged individually more than 15 grand um, are the Zoo Boise. The Woklaw Zoo, San Diego Zoo, uh, British and Irish Associations of mm -hmm. Zoos and Aquariums, European Association of Zoos okay. and Aquariums, okay. Bavu Nature. I don't, I'm probably saying that wrong. And then interestingly enough, in one yeah, of their yeah. newsletters I was reading that just came out a few uh, last month, interestingly enough, um, zoos from the Czech Republic, like five of them, are giving crazy amounts of mm -hmm. money, awesome amounts of money to, the, uh, to helping save the Saula. Which is, you know, I mean, that's a lot of money because they, they, it's, 
one of the things we talk about is priority, like priority of species. Sure. So it's great that they're they're getting that much money, you know, compared yeah, to all and, the and, crisis and, and, points, but they need more. I mean, that's that's the bottom line. Well, they need and more. money is right. And, and I, I guess I'm to summarize my two biggest pleas yeah. are money, but then also awareness. Mm-hmm. So most people have never even heard of this creature. So obviously if you can't give money, just give awareness, like them on Facebook, tell your friends, invite your friends to like them on mm-hmm. Facebook. Talk, I mean, they're gorgeous animals to look at. Yeah. Just let people know because somebody might have a dollar and they might want to donate. Yeah. And I think that like the Czech zoo, not only are they donating some of these che- uh, Czechoslovakian zoos, not only what they're doing is donating money, but one of them even named like a restaurant the, the huh. Saula restaurant. Right, right. Just to get people like, huh, what does that mean? And reading the signs and like talking about it. So there's other thing, other, you know, there's other ways you can do besides like giving, giving money, although that's going to help the most. Right, uh, right. And so, yeah. So check them out. The Saula working group uh, on Facebook, www.savethesaula.org. Chris will put the link on the show notes. We can do our little part, right? To spread the word. Uh, and then hopefully, hopefully this will help. All of us together can help save the Saula from extinction. And, mm-hmm. and the other group that I really want everybody to pay attention to, um, if they haven't already yet, is the Global Wildlife Conservation. And that is a group that Dr. Long, who I'll be interviewing on Thursday, mm-hmm. that he is the director of species conservation there. And they just do amazing work for so many animals. Uh, obviously, I'm sure everybody's in love with the Saula now, just like us. Mm-hmm. But... Yeah. In general, they yeah, just, yeah. you know, by biodiversity is life and they protect life on earth. That's just simply what they do. And they have a lot of projects to pick from whatever animal you like, be it rept- reptilian or um, hoofstock or primates. I mean, they do it all. And so, but one of the projects that they focus on, they highlight, which is uh, Dr. Dr. Long and I talk a little bit about, although he talks more probably about the Saula working group in the interview, but he, it, it is, mm-hmm. is they want to, they want to help out this mysterious Asian unicorn. And they have, uh, of course they help out the Saula working group, which is an independent group, but they donate money to them, but they also um, work with the government there. They protect Saula habitat. They raise funds for conservation of the Saula. They are monitoring the Saula and other species that are also critically endangered in the Anamites mm. uh, that we know very little about, like the giant mo- jack and a few others that I mentioned. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And they're basically, their policy is they're adopting a zero loss goal for the Saula. So they're hitting it hardcore. So definitely check out right. globalwildlife.org. I look to see if they're hiring like every day. And <laughs> they're, they're on fa- they're on if Facebook. If you just disappear on John and your babies, I'm going to be no, so mad. No, I know, at you. I know. I'll, You'll be at the orphanage. Well, I already know where. Well, you're that be. or maybe maybe they'll just like hint hint, Doctor Long. Maybe they'll just yeah. hire us to do podcasts or something. Some a way that that you yeah. and I are. Sports everybody people. has a different, yeah. and I think Doctor Long and I talk a little bit about this. Is like everybody, yeah. it has a different way that they can help, and obviously boots on the ground is yeah. a huge yeah. way. Uh, yeah, but yeah, yeah, but yeah. not yeah. everybody can do that. So there's. A, a lot of other ways. And of course, if you go to some of these websites and groups that I mentioned, they provide several ways that you can get involved or a lot of even just mm-hmm. being, become an educator. Chris and I are educators. That's all right. we do. That's how right. we help. Uh, besides donating money, of course, yeah. here and there. Um, but yeah. Yeah, everybody, anybody can do that. Right. So, right, right, right. So yeah. Yep. So please, please, if you can't donate a dollar or more to the Sala working group, Definitely go like them on Facebook. I'm going like to be checking it. I want to. Yeah, I want yeah, to yeah. hit 500 likes, I guys. Know. I know. They, come on. All right. All right. We can do it. We can do it. We can do it. They're 345. You know, we'll see how they go uh, once this airs. Now, uh, real quick, conservation tips of the week. You know, I guess one of the things I was keep talking about is global warming, saving energy. We talked about shutting off lights. One thing I, you know, I didn't mention yet is like turn yes. off gadgets. Yes. Like you know. Computers, you know, it's hard with a computer, you know, computers draw so much energy. So make sure you have your energy settings set on your computers and windows. You can Google it. Yeah, if make, you need make to things di- like on my, on so my they- iPhone, I have it, the lighting's very dim on it. Yeah. So it takes up less, ba- less battery unless yeah. I really need it. And you can less do the same batteries. on your computer. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, Little yeah. stuff. Yeah, and, you know, make sure like you know any gaming consoles are are powered down. TV, make sure your TV's powered off because anytime that green light's on, 
it's pulling power. And again, that's, that's a major contributor to climate change. The more we do this, the more we take little chunks here, there, yeah, and there, and then we're going to make a the, big difference. So, and it saves you money in the long run. Absolutely. It saves you money and, you know, your babies, your friends, your children, they see you doing it. They adopt the habit and that yeah. just becomes normal. All right. So now as promised, the unicorn myth. Yay. Now I was, I was surprised the first place where like, if you had to guess anywhere in the world, it's not New Zealand, anywhere in the world where unicorn myth started popping up, where would you think? So for me, because I obviously have such a uh, close relationship with Arabian orcs, I, I would say yeah. somewhere in the Middle East. Okay. They were second. Oh, okay. actually the, the Japanese and the Chinese had this thing called the Quillen, fifth mm -hmm. century BCE. Wow. This was like the first myth of a unicorn type species. And it had a body of a dragon, rainbow scales, and a single horn. Oh, rainbow scales. Right. I love it. Yeah, yeah. So that was like the first quote unquote unicorn. Now, the one you're talking about is the Greeks. Okay. And so like turn of, you know, like you know, two thousand years ago plus. They they described a unicorn with a it was a white body with a red head, cloven feet. And I think that was the Arabian oryx. Sure. The Arabian oryx is just gorgeous, mostly all white. Yeah. They have some brown high points yeah. on their hooves and I believe and a little brown yeah. on their ears. But yeah, yeah, I can see that. Yeah. And when you look at it from the side, it looks like a single horn by their silhouette. It's when they turn and you're like, oh, they have two. So I think the, the Arabian oryx is kind of where it originated with the Greeks. Now, in okay. the 1300s, Marco Polo, when he was in Asia, described an Asian unicorn but mm -hmm. it was an asian rhino <laughs> so, a single horned rhino <laughs> that's what he he thought it was a unicorn but it was the rhino uh okay now now it wasn't until about the 18th century where we get this unicorn that we think of today the horses with the the single horn and then back then whalers used to sell narwhal tusks as unicorn horns so that's where like the spiral unicorn oh, horn came so interesting. from. Yeah. yeah. Now my quick story, I got it. Cause we're, we're actually, God, I didn't think we'd run this long. The back in when, my teaching days, I was at Clemson and I had a really horrible cold, Angie, like terrible cold. So I took some Dayquil uh -oh. and if you take Dayquil, <laughs> it, it can kind of make you a little uh, loopy, yeah. right? So here I am teaching class and it was reproduction I, you know, me and my mammoth cloning. And so I was going down that route and talking about, you know, and I was talking to my students and I'm like, yeah, I think we're really close to, to being able to clone the unicorn and it's going to be awesome when we do. And, and, and the students looked at me and they're like, wait, 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 Dr. Mortensen, Dr. Mortensen. And I said, yeah, what? They're like, back up. Cloning the unicorn? What? <laughs> so they all had this huge <laughs> laugh. I meant to say cloning the mammoth. Yeah, obviously. But they went and created a Facebook group called Bringing Back the Unicorn. Oh my gosh, that's so and funny. And it was, it was for me that we were going to bring back, quote unquote, the unicorn. Oh, wow. So uh, no, unicorns are real. Good for those students. Myth, that's hilarious. But yeah, those are my, my Clemson fans. Uh, I love them. So, you know, anyways, thanks for us. You know, visit us, uh, allcreaturespod.com, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, at All Creatures, or All Creatures Pod. We're there. All of our links are on our website. Show notes are up there. Thank you. And we will be back next week with the new species. Thank and you. And don't guys. forget Thursday, right? Yes, yes. Thank you for learning and listening and loving. Team, save the Saula. We can do this. Saula. Got it. Saula. Yeah, we got it. Listen, learn, share. Join the movement at allcreaturespod.com.